Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. On today's special Thanksgiving program, we take a moment and look back at 2020 and review what the Lord has done through this ministry. We're so glad you've joined us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. And I am Jeffrey Seif. And we are looking at Thanksgiving. Do you know what that word is in the Greek? Eucharistia, it's where you get the word Eucharist from. That's when we thank God for God. Here we thank God for God and we thank you for you and it's great to be here with you, yes? You amaze me every time, <laughs> right? The knowledge just seeps out. Well, what I, I take from wow. this is I'm thankful we're at this desk during this crazy year that we've been through. Yes, we're you still know, able to do through thick do. and thin, that uh, you know, the Word of God carries on and our friends help us. And it's great to be at the other end of 2020. I'm looking over the horizon. I, I'm hoping for great things. I mean, we had a grandbaby born this year. So, you we know, had I some mean, good. Me too. Right, yeah. right. And she's adorable. So there's, you know, we always have to look at the good things. And that's why we have Thanksgiving. Take a time just to kind of deep breath and look at what you God's know, done for us. Most people spend too much time looking behind. If you drive a car, you need all your eyes focused on what's ahead of you. You can't be looking back to see where you just passed. And uh, we're going to look and see where we've gone and where we're going, but life needs to be lived in the future. That's right. We actually began 2020 with the series, Joshua, More Than a Conqueror. Let's see some excerpts right now. at Mount Sinai was a miracle, a personal message to Moses inscribed in stone by the very finger of Adonai. Days later, it's left me wondering, still searching for words to explain our journey on the mount. Why did he choose me? He could have chosen any of the elders. Gershom? Eliezer. There was this thick cloud that covered us. For six days, nothing could be seen. And all the more I wondered why he'd chosen me. As though Moses gets all the attention initially, and rightly so as the principal leader, he had an assistant. His name was Joshua. Interesting fellow to be sure. His name was Hosea originally, but his name was changed from a word for salvation to Jehoshua, that is, God is salvation. And he was going to learn that. Interesting word in Hebrew, in Greek, salvation, sozo, means uh, save, uh, it means heal, be made whole, put back together again. The word Yeshua, or Joshua in Hebrew, it means to uh, heal, it means to deliver, it means to redeem, to save. And Joshua was all that, and in so doing, he led Israel. And he indeed was more than just a conqueror, though he was that to be sure. It's been a miraculous journey. The Jordan River has dried up to facilitate its crossing, the mighty walls of Jericho have fallen down, and now, with heaven-sent cunning, Joshua leads his men to yet another victory at the city of Ai. I went up in flames, finally. Israel got burned beforehand, however, and in another sense, and I'm gonna tell that story here today. It's a tragic story, actually. Victory's one thing, defeat's another, in the Bible, we get a little bit of both. Actually, in the scripture, if you look at the miraculous victories so far, the parting of the sea, the Jordan, the Israelites crossing through, yes, that's 17 verses for that. 
If you look at the, the miracle and the war at Jericho, a sum total of 27 verses for that. The Battle of Ai, a small city, it shouldn't have taken much. It was a tragedy, 81 verses by my reckoning for that in the Hebrew Bible. You know, men, we want the best in life. We feel we don't always get it. We think we, we go for an ideal. We think we got a raw deal. Uh, get that faith at work and uh, seek the Lord for what he would have you to do and find the divine strategy he has for you to help you to be the head and not the tail, to be a conqueror and not conquered, to be a victor and not a victim. And you yourself can experience with God how like Joshua, you can be more than a conqueror. That was an excerpt from our series, Joshua, More Than a Conqueror. And if you have missed any of the series from this past year, they're available free for viewing on levitt.tv or levitt.com on our website. That's right. We couldn't do any of this without our viewers' help. And we want them, uh, you, to in fact be more than a conqueror. And uh, we offer biblical medicine for life's assorted hurts. I believe the Lord wants us to be winners and not losers, victors and not victims. And that series goes into the biblical text to give us a window into how to do that. I want to ask you, please, to help me, to help us to do that. It's the end of the year, and if you would like to catch up a little bit, if inclined, please help us by making a gift to help us move the ball forward into the new year, into the new economy. Lots of great stories to tell, lots of good news to share. I want to thank you in advance for helping us do that. Well, we are so thankful for all the things that you have taught us, and one of the most beautiful series in the footsteps of the rabbi from Tarsus. That's a, that's a big title, but you went all across the Mediterranean. Rome. Didn't you feel? Oh you were in Rome. You that's were, right. You were literally in the Mediterranean Sea, weren't you? And you guys sent me there. Thank you. You know, I know people want to travel the Bible lands. Uh, we take a camera and take you to it. Thanks. It was a beautiful series, but you also taught us so much. And we're going to take you right now to some excerpts from that series. Something strange happened to him on that road to Damascus many years ago. The rabbi from Tarsus traversed the path, and there he was knocked off his horse, floored. He was as good as blind, so much so that he had to get led into Damascus by the hand. And there, one of the brethren laid hands on him, and Paul began to see. Oh, but this man didn't just see things materially. He was given a kind of spiritual vision as well, and what he envisioned would change the world. Seems that in Jerusalem proper, in proximity to the temple, there were porches roundabout, and one of which we're told that the believers met. Uh, it was a place called Solomon's Portico, and there they would teach and discuss the issues of the day. And there was a whole lot of discussion going on about a lot of things. Principal among them was the question, what on God's earth is the rabbi from Tarsus doing? Word had spread of his ministry to individuals of non-Jewish extract, and people were disconcerted. Prior to this time, those who followed Jesus were Jewish people. They were women and men of Jewish extract who lived and functioned as Jews. They were Jewish people who were for Jesus. But what now? Women and men of non-Jewish extract were coming in, but the question is, what do we do with them?
Paul came to Rome as a courtesy of the state. He had appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar he came here in Rome. You'll see some sites behind me. One is an Arch of Constantine, came a bit later. The Forum is in close proximity, as is the Great Colosseum behind, which came a little later as well. But this is Rome. And when Paul was here initially, he came here, as I said, he was transported courtesy of Rome by a centurion. He was under house arrest, and it's from here where he wrote uh, a few epistles. He wrote to the Ephesians, he wrote to the Colossians, he wrote a personal letter to Philemon, and then he wrote a document called the Philippians, which is arguably the friendliest of Paul's letter. That's not to say he was a mean sort, but it seems that when he wrote the others, he was disconcerted about one thing or another, but the Philippian correspondence was a thank you letter. It seems to me that the church has gone, has its various traditions, but we do well to open up the primary literature. And therein, when we read Paul's writings, we can sense his heart. Better it is, it seems to me, that we get in touch with what he had to say over and against what the traditions of the day might be. And so for that reason, I advocate that we do well to walk in the footsteps of the rabbi from Tarsus, to read his word and to follow his example, because that is truly where we learn what it means to be Christian. The scenery throughout that whole series was breathtaking, yes. but what else was breathtaking was your teaching. It was so on point. Thank well, you. Well, you're kind. I think if people stay with the biblical word, there's lots of good stuff. There's not as enough uh, uh, biblical teaching uh, at the end of the day the way I perceive it. Speaking of which, here's a great Thanksgiving verse. Uh, he says in uh, Philippians chapter 4, my God will fulfill every need of yours according to the riches of his glory. God's got riches, he's got glory, and he's got a heart to supply needs. Isn't that a good word? It is a good word, and we need to hear that because it's been a tough year. We haven't taken any tours to Israel. Right. It's also Thanksgiving season, so much to be thankful for, even in the midst of what we've all been going through. Right. Yes. Crazy year, yes. but, but some good. And I just want to let all of you know, if uh, you want to take a tour to the Holy Land, it will change your life. 2020, yes, has been crazy, but I don't think any tours have gone. If we can go, if this ministry can get into Israel, we are going. We go two times a year, hopefully in the spring and also in the fall. We'd love to have you go with us. I'll say that many places that you've taught, we go and we would love for you to join us on a tour. You can find all the information on levitt.com. Yes. Another series you brought to life was all about uh, the kings of old in the yes. Old Testament. Yes. Well, you know, the political climate is so interesting in our culture. And it was really interesting back in the day. And uh, our friends, you, uh, donated to help us to get the story out. We looked at political intrigue, social unrest, bad kings and kingdoms and good ones as we journeyed through the biblical narrative. It's a great series. Let's take a look at some excerpts from Kings and Kingdoms right now. in the book of Kings, actually in the old Hebrew Bible, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Kings, from Saul at the beginning all the way to uh, the ending Kings with the fall of the Northern and Southern Kingdom. We're going to explore that in this series, Kings and Kingdoms. 
It's not that the biblical author gave him a pass, but he definitely passed through note of his indiscretions, which were egregious, in order to give him credit. What am I talking about? I don't want to play my hand just yet, but I want to say that the story had to do with where we are right now. Adjacent to me is Jericho. We're right there at the lowest part of the earth. Jordan is not far away. Saudi Arabia is south. Uh, you go uh, up the Judean foothills, which are adjacent to me. You get to Jerusalem. This is borderland, and it was a significant border. When Israel broke away from Judah, they established this as a border outpost. It was significant. You had to control this in order to control the gateway to Jerusalem. It was very important. You know, America has thousands of miles of border with ocean, with the Atlantic and Pacific. We're not worried about getting attacked by whales. Canada hasn't been a problem. And really, until recently, Central and South America hasn't been an issue. Now an invasion is less to do about wars as it is to do with desperate people. And that raises the issue in my generation and in this particular moment about what to do about borders. When I look at kings and kingdoms, while I'm looking that generally, specifically what I'm looking at are issues associated with faithfulness to biblical vision. And I say that to you as you're looking for what leads, who leads, what ideas move forward, what personalities best advocate for those ideas. Uh, as you in a democracy weigh in and decide what you want to do, who you want to support, whether it's in government, in the broader sense of political government, who you want to attach yourself to in business, in the business of business, or even who you want to attach yourself to in the business of love, whether it's building a biological kingdom, whether it's building a business kingdom, whether it's considering the national kingdom uh, that we live in, our country. Let me encourage you with what the biblical authors encourage us. Put your energies and support behind that which advocates faithfulness to the biblical economy. Support faithful men. Support policies that reflect biblical vision. This, according to the authors of this, the Bible, this is a recipe for success in life. And it certainly is true in the Jewish world in America, where many people are Jewish in a cultural sense, but not necessarily in a religious sense when it comes to commitment to biblical text. One can live out a cultural kind of religion where God is at a distance and religion's at a distance. This is not only a problem in modernity, it was a problem in antiquity, in Bible days, in fact. And You've heard about fake news. Well, I want to talk to you about fake Jews. Sounds like I'm being cute, but the story's not so funny. This Jeroboam, over 20 times in the Hebrew Bible, because of all of this, he's referred to as the man who made Israel to sin. It starts off as a political issue, and then it translates into a spiritual one as well. It reminds me, by the way, in so many ways of the world that we live in. Let's learn a lesson and follow the God of Israel. Never mind fake Jews, fake politics, fake religion. Let's go after the real deal. such an encouraging word from King David about giving thanks. I love that. Yeah, we give thanks for all of you. You have kept us on the air. This program started in 1979, wow. just on TV. And now we've expanded. We're on this wonderful thing called the internet. 
I yes. mean, 79, could you, we couldn't even imagine that we'd have no. something like that. We have wonderful social media outlets. There's all kinds of extra information on there. Find us, and we're, again, thankful for you making all of this possible. Yes, yes and folk are keeping us on the air, but really you're wanting to keep on the air good news through the eyes of the Jews and Times News. And against that backdrop, great series on Revelation. Thank you for helping us tell the story. It's a good time to open up the book. What do you think? Let's check it out now. The book of Revelation has been a go-to source for a long, long time. Individuals trying to look at what's happening in the news on the one hand and to look at what's happening in the good news on the other to see if there's a correlation. Well, here we want to peek behind the veil and look at the visions noted in the apocalypse. John isn't in the best of places himself. Our author is banished to an island out here in the Aegean Sea called Patmos. And from this island now, he sees things to come. He gives voice to these dispatches going global in his day throughout the empire. He sees in chapter 6 uh, visions, the first of which is a horse. And the rider has a, a, a crown given to him. And he goes forth in verse 2 as a conqueror, so he might conquer. He sees another horse in verse 4, fiery red. The one riding on it was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And he was given a sword. Our journey continues in the 13th chapter. The author sees these beasts coming out of the sea. He sees uh, uh, just more demon-inspired misery. He sees demonic forces in verse 7 invested against the Kedoshim, against the saints, and they overcome them. We're seeing that this diabolical leader, this beast, by the way, in the Johannine literature, in John's you know, letters, he's the Antichrist. Here he's the beast. Uh, there's different languages for the devil when the devil has his day, but here a beast, he comes and we're told he was given authority temporarily over every tribe, people, tongue, and nation, and all who dwell on the earth worship him. Everyone whose name is not written from the foundation in the world in the book of life and of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 11 opens up uh, with a picture out of Ezekiel, who toward the end of his book is beckoned to go and measure the temple. I mention that here because in chapter 11, verse 1, uh, you have the command to do much the same. There are those in the temple worshiping, outside the courtyards are trampled. And then we're told that there are these two witnesses who are given a voice to prophesy in these very difficult days, and hell comes against them, but they keep speaking. We're told one of these two uh, has power to shut up the heavens so there'll be no rain, and the other has power over waters to turn them into blood, etc. This reminds me of the days of Elijah and the days of Moses, and some think these witnesses are akin to those personalities. One prays and such up the heavens, the other prays and the waters turn to blood. I looked and behold a vast multitude, no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. It's not just Jews. These are people standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So this author in century one, writing from here, banished as he was, all the earlier apostles were killed. Uh, he's banished, and he has a vision of a world that goes upside down. He sees Jews that, that, that walked with the Lord and died with the Lord. Uh, he sees uh, uh, non-Jews. For him, the church is made up of one new man, Jews and non-Jews alike. We're seeing that today, by the way. Similarly, we're seeing Jewish witnesses to Yeshua, non-Jewish witnesses. It really is fascinating. It was like that in century one. It's like that today. And here it's prophesied in the good book. And these together, we're told, are standing before the Lamb, you know, uh, language for Yeshua, the crucified one. And they're singing in verse 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne 
and to the Lamb. It's not just my God, it's not the Jewish God, the God of all. I love it. Uh, this author sees an arising. He sees a rebellion. He sees that the wicked empire is going to be thrown off at day's end, that the slain, that the crucified one will prevail. And those with him similarly, though it might seem they prevail not just now, nevertheless, victory is theirs at the ragged edge of time. I've got to be honest with all of you, when COVID started, I had no idea if uh, Jeff Churches would make it, if funds would still be coming in, if people would still be giving offerings, if this ministry would make it. And we have, by the grace of God, we've, yes. we've continued on. It's amazing. But I think every generation has things that are unanticipated. But we got through it. And thank you for you. I thank God for you for helping us, you know, sometimes. Amidst the turbulence of trying times, people hold back. Um, but thank you for still reaching in and helping us to tell this story. The good news needs to get out, especially now when there's so much bad news in people's heads, you know. And, and you kept us going, and thank you for that. And I want to thank you in advance for the future. That's right. We began the program with Greek Thanksgiving. You said Thanksgiving in Greek. Can you give me the Hebrew name? Todor Rabbah. Oh, Thank you very much. Yes. We know that one. Of course. One. That's what you say Bavakasha. Bavakasha. Yeah. You're That's welcome. Yes. <laughs> very thankful. Like very thankful for this yes. time. And thanks is good in any language, you know. And I think that we do well just to be thankful people for our own sakes. We're more attractive if we're thankful in our hearts. We really are. That's right. We have more to come. We leave this program today with a song from our founder, Zola Levitt. But we also love to say this. As you go now, a sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim. Please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.